Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Uh, I am Alice Mong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and I want to welcome our uh, audience on Facebook and Zoom and other uh, on online to this episode three uh, about Corona's update, coronavirus update, facts from Hong Kong and beyond. And this is, like I mentioned, uh, this is episode three. We started it about two weeks ago. And, and we're really delighted that today we have um, a Hong Kong expert, uh, uh, Professor Paul K.S. Chen, uh, who is with us. He is the chairman of Department of Micro Microbiology from Chinese University of Hong Kong to be our um, third speaker and giving us a live update on what is going on. Um, he is a clinical virologist and, uh, and we f the de definition of uh, virology is study of viruses uh, and you know the disease that, that are uh, stem from it. So we have an Hong Kong expert and also a global expert. Uh, Professor Chen is also a partner of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. And he's editor in chief of Journal of Vir Virological Methods. So a really eminent expert uh, who is able to um, uh, give us his insight on what's happening. Um, as I mentioned to Professor Chen uh, earlier, uh, a week ago when we had the event with uh, Professor Michael Levitt, uh, we were talking about the Diamond Princess. A week later, a lot has changed, and we're really eager to hear from uh, Professor Chen to give us an update and also uh, kind of his thoughts uh, and expertise on this very, um, uh, this interesting development and, uh, and, and we'll also take, be taking your question. Uh, please send your question uh, online and we'll try to get to them. If not, we will try to answer them offline. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Chen uh, to give us an update as of today. Hi, thank you, Alice. That's my great opportunity to, uh, to be here and share some information with you. As, as you introduced, I'm a clinical virologist. So um, forgive me, most of my perspective will be from the virus point of view. So a brief update um, to you would be, obviously everyone is aware that we are facing more country or cities with quite unexpected um, huge outbreak occurring over the last few days. So I think that has moved our attention a little bit from the cruise ship to for example, cities in Korea, uh, for example, cities in Italy. And uh, we still need to learn what will happen in these new areas. And you, can you tell us, uh, Professor Chen, more about this uh, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network that you're a part of? Uh, what does this group do? And, and, and how long have you been involved with? Uh, so uh, kind of, it is a global network. So can you tell us more about this? So actually, this is a WHO initiative. Um, uh, it has been there for years, but of course, uh, it's going to deal with um, crises that occurred in different parts of the world. And most of the time, it's crises like, for example, in the resources poor country, and it's recurrent problem like cholera, those kind of outbreak. And crises like the current situation, uh, of course, is not very often, but I think this network is now playing a very critical role to help the whole world how to combat this outbreak. So you are in conversation with experts from other parts of the world because, like I said, the development has been so fast in this just last couple of days uh, with what's happening in Italy, Iran, um, uh, also in, I think there's talk of uh, a pandemic. Uh, when do you see that, you know, that P word uh, coming? Do you see that coming soon or is it? Well, um, pandemic, you can look at this word from different perspective. Well, the WHO would like to say they will only admit that there's a pandemic when there are more than or two or more than two continents facing a huge outbreak. So if you look at the situation, Asia is definitely one continent and Europe perhaps maybe coming up very soon. So I think pandemic rest from the, from the lay person point of view is, is a huge global outbreak. Some people we will get huge as certain number. Some the other people may say this is not yet. But my personal perspective, we are moving very, very close to a pandemic. I see. Um, I think from the microbiology perspective, and as a clinical virologist, 
Uh, what is special about this COVID-19 virus? Uh, what distinguishes it from SARS and also seasonal flu, um, which we, you know, we're more familiar with? So can you talk about that? Well, Alice, you pick up a very good question. And, uh, and I really want to explain to people with reference to two viruses that you mentioned, the SARS-CoV in uh, 2003 and also the influenza that we come across every year. Well, this virus perhaps, uh, I mean, the little coronavirus perhaps has both behavior. Well, um, this new coronavirus, like SARS-2003, in a sense that they tend to bind to cells that are more commonly found in the lower respiratory tract. That means when they're in fact, they have the ability to go deep into the lung. So they cause pneumonia and they cause severe disease. Well, on the other hand, if you look at the overall transmission, it's more like an influenza that we are facing every year. So you are going to have uh, family members infected, friends getting together, get infected. So it, it's like um, maybe middle or some characteristic like a SARS-CoV-2003, some characteristic like an influenza that we are seeing every year. I see. And I also want to explain, uh, I'm not wearing a mask. Uh, Professor Chen is wearing a mask. He's wearing it out of respect for me because he is dealing with patients, and uh, and and I I really respect him and thank him for that for coming here today. And right now, I think what uh, that's another question. I also a lot of our um, uh, the last two weeks we've also have uh, been asked quite a bit uh, is the mask question. And even uh, in the first episode with Professor Cowling, uh, he doesn't deal with patients, but you do. So right now, in terms of layman, um, you know we had heard about the mask, uh, uh, running out of masks, and so on. And right now, it seems like globally, that's going to be an issue. So, so what is your advice now for, mm. for Hong Kong, uh, mask or no mask, and, and yeah? Well, well, this simple question seems to come with a complicated answer. Well, to wear a mask to prevent this kind of infection, like influenza, lawful coronavirus, definitely have some benefits. Um, I think the difficulty is that if we want to give an advice to a public level, so just generally for everyone, that becomes a very complicated. Because as far as I can see, the difficulty is that after you advise people to have masks, what are the associated changes in their behavior? For example, um, hand hygiene, do they still stick with hand hygiene? For example, do they uh, go out more or less often because of masks or no masks. And also to the, to the very difficult extent is the shortage. And does it create uh, uh, like uh, another psychological unreasonable response and therefore affecting other social measures? So I think that's the difficulty to, you know, we need the policy maker to, to deal with the last decision. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the uh, measures um, that the government here in Hong Kong has uh, uh, suggested, you know, is working from home, the working from home policy. And my understanding is the government, Hong Kong government, will probably be lifting that next week, uh, at least for the government workers. But schools, uh, just the other day, um, have announced that the school closure is going to continue until April. So in terms of the, the, the measures of keeping people from, uh, uh, you know, going to work, and also keeping students at home. How do you think that has worked out uh, here in Hong Kong? And, and right now, my understanding is in Japan, in Korea, uh, also in Lombardy, people are suggesting uh, similar measures. So you, do you think that has been effective? Um, considering we also only now have um, our cases still under 100, and I know we still have uh, the death is still at two. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about the, the well, state this, working from home policy? Yeah, thanks, Alice. Um, I think all this come down from the single concept of social distancing. So in, in managing this uh, disease that spread for us, and you do not have a good treatment, you do not have a, a vaccine to prevent. So we only rely on social distancing. Now, how effective is a certain action in terms of social distancing, like close school, work from home, I think all these have to be done in connection with other measures. None of single one will work. And the second uh, very important determinant is uh, at what stage we are in the epidemic. So are we seeing only few cases, mainly imported? Are we at the stage where 
a lot of community transmission going on, or is it like influenza? Uh, it's already a lot of people transmitted. So all these take into account. Um, well, after all, um, these days in Hong Kong, we stop school, we ask people work from home. Obviously, it has some effect to decrease the community spread, but whether it is the most effective way, whether if we do it earlier, or whether if we have other measures together, will bring it even more effective. That remains a question. Yeah. I see. And one of your research interests is uh, on a safety of uh, respiratory therapy in the post-SARS era. Uh, so can you explain uh, to us and the audience here what is that about? And is there um, a respiratory therapy uh, in the post-COVID-19 era uh, that, you know, after, after this is all over, is this something that you're also looking into mm. uh, uh, in your research? Well, actually, it's, it's in collaboration with my partner, um, uh, respiratory physician. And uh, what we have in uh, 2003 in SARS, we got a very traumatic experience. You know, people, when they have infection of the chest, sometimes they do not breathe well. We, we want to put uh, oxygen into their lung. So you need to add some pressure to push the oxygen, the air into it. So as you push the air in, then air will come out. So this kind of um, therapy, we realize that it will create uh, what we call the erosion from the infected person. So you are, you are helping the spread of the virus to a further way, a further extent than you expect. So we learned that if we want to give oxygen, there are, there are very high chance, depending on how you give it, that you contaminate the environment and of course other patients. So, so now people are very careful about uh, delivering oxygen therapy for patients. Uh, I mean, the means how to deliver is, is very important. Uh, and also, as, as a professional, a public health professional, um, I know we've heard one of the reasons for this uh, show and this continuous uh, coverage has been uh, trying to um, dispel some of the fake news and rumors about uh, the origin or just, you know, uh, uh, just a lot of the um, uh, incorrect information. So as far as you have heard as a professional, what has been the biggest false rumor uh, that uh, for about COVID-19 that you would like to help dispel. For example, there's been talk online about that this uh, this was made in a lab. Um, you know, I, I think I I firmly believe information and truth it will help shed the light into this. But as a professional, what are you concerned about in terms of uh, uh, of this 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 um, you know the, the the spreading of false news? And I think some of the complaint concern has been the rise of social media compared to uh, SARS 2003. We didn't really uh, have that much. I, I, I'm sure there were also uh, fake news as well, but the way in terms, of, in some ways I find it very interesting, the spread, spread of the disease, of this virus, <laughs> and the spread of fake news <laughs> is fake also news, equally yes. fast. So can you kind of talk about uh, some of the things that you would like to address as, yeah. a, as a, a professional uh, in this area? Yeah, maybe a couple of them, like what you raised, uh, people may suspect this could be a, a virus man-made released from certain laboratory, this kind of thing. But if you look at it logically, if we study the genome, all the information suggests is a virus originate from certain animal source and just happen it jumped to human. And these things happen. It does happen. And there's, there's no hints, at least from the scientific point of view, that this is a virus man-made, this is a virus kept by a certain person and leak out suddenly. So, so I think um, I don't think I don't see any evidence to to me suggest it is man-made. Whereas other uh, fast-spreading fake news, like um, people may talk about the uh, how good the virus can survive, and one of them, well, I don't think is it, I, I can't say it's totally wrong, but. Um, likely does not happen is the airborne transmission yeah. about this virus. So, so far we do not have good evidence to say it is airborne, but this is going to be a very, um, you know, alarming and scaring fake news if it is. So, so I think these are the things that um, we have to clarify immediately without uh, creating too much trouble. Okay, this is one question, now that you mentioned about airborne, uh, one of the questions from our audience. Um, uh, online, um, he asks, he or she asks, if a carrier coughs 
or sneezes and then walks away and then I walk into his location seconds later, will I pick up the virus? Um, I understand it shouldn't be airborne, but will I? So how do you address that question? Well, um, so that question is ac exactly asking whether the virus is airborne. Well, as I said, so far there's no good evidence to show this virus is airborne. So if you, you go into a room, cough and sneeze, what happens is that the droplet, the secretion that you cough out contains virus and it has a certain weight. It will fall on, sub, uh, on, on the objects, the ground, maybe within 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and then the next person walk in. What the air he or she breathe do not have virus, but the virus are on the floor, I see. on the objects. So the chance that you got infected is due to touching those things, not due to inhaling the air. So that's why um, it also comes to the use of masks. Masks prevent inhaling the air, but it does not prevent you to touch. So if you just wear the mask, forgetting about the hand hygiene, then you are going to have problem. So the hand hygiene and the washing of the hands, that's where it comes in. So does that, another uh, area that uh, I also want to ask, uh, and friends have, we've talked about this, is temperature. Uh, uh, it, does that explain why? Because uh, that, that also this, this air droplet, the, the virus is also um, causing, in fact, there's more COVID-19 in Singapore. Uh, uh, than Hong Kong, and Hong Kong, Singapore is also hot, and so we were talking about whether it's the temperature or the droplet. But I guess right now with humidity, the way it is, so so the droplet is also the issue that we're also seeing in Singapore and other uh, places. So so what happens when uh, I guess in the SARS case, when the weather got hotter in 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 April and May, SARS kind of went away. Do you think that's going to happen now too with uh, COVID nineteen? Well, um, purely from the virology side, what can affect the survival of the viruses are actually humidity, temperature. These two factors affect. But when it comes to real life, it becomes more complicated um, because you need to consider the human behavior associated with humidity and temperature, whether they uh, come together more often or whether they go outdoor more, oft more often. So. If you put an experiment to examine the viability of the virus, then different humidity, different temperature does affect. But for the whole population transmission, that's a very difficult question. And I, I don't think we should um, take for granted that higher temperature later on will kill the virus for you. So I don't, we should not rely on, on the summertime to come. I see. And now I wanted to ask you uh, more of a personal question um, in terms of you are a clinical virologist, and where were you in 2003 doing SARS, and what got you into this field uh, of clinical virology about you know looking into uh, uh, viruses, and 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 I part of that question is also one I wanted to ask you is, do you think there are enough experts like yourself um, who are being trained? Uh, in Asia or greater China in this area. Uh, I know uh, WHO, the former um, the head of WHO, Bar Dr. Marco Chen, um, I, and it's, so the question I, I, I'm I looking at is really the, the expertise from this part of the world. Unfortunately, you know, whether it's SARS or COVID-19, um, you know, it's, it's, Asia is part of the, kind yeah. of some of the epicenter. Epicenter, so, yeah. so Tell me why you got interested and what you were doing during 2003 doing SARS and how would you like to encourage more people, not just Asian, but more young people to go into this field? Well, first, um, um, why viruses are interesting or important, uh, simple reason because it causes various health problems like a very acute one, influenza, coronavirus, and it also causes long-term problems. Um, you may or may not aware that actually more than 15% of human cancers are actually caused by viruses. 15? 15. 15, okay. yeah, one five human cancers. That's quite a large number, yeah. So you can imagine the extent that virus can alter human health. So I think that's why uh, it is an uh, important and interesting area. And, and you asked the question, uh, clinical virologists. So uh, yes, we have uh, virologists, uh, 
basic scientists, virologists who know the virus very well. We have clinicians take care of patients. They know human body very well. But clinical virology is, is trained to understand both sides. So I think with this unique combination of knowledge, uh, it is sometimes necessary in dealing with certain situation. Well, um, uh, clinical virologist is, is a rare creature in any part of the world, and including mainland China. We do not have enough. I think in the future... Not enough, I, in, not yet. Not enough. yet, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope right. in the future more brilliant young people can come into this field. Uh, I have to say the the you know the medical professional. I mean the story we hear and SARS as well. I think the front line, uh, you know the, the 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 people who are in the hospital, the doctors and nurses, um, they really are the the unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in this case in COVID nineteen, the stories you hear of of the doctors and and the medical professionals in China in Wuhan. Um, it's really, um, it, it, it's really heart wrenching. Um, the the price they're paying, and and although the government is building a hospital, it sounds like there's not enough professional medical professional to keep up with some of these these uh, um, health issues. So what you said about uh, more, uh, in some ways, a lot of what we're talking about here in, in Asia society is really encouraging young people to look at fields. Uh, in fact, I really would love to um, uh, spend some time talking to you later on about, you know, uh, encouraging young people to go into a field like this. Uh, public health, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not going away. I think, it, you know, whether it's SARS, MERS, Ebola, uh, it seems like every uh, couple of years we have, uh, we hear of a major uh, epidemic or pandemic like this. And, and it's one thing to have the hospital, and, and but you also need the, the professionals like yourself to be tackling some of these issues and research. So uh, hats off to uh, really the scientists and 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 um, and your profession. So I wanted to uh, pay tribute to 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 the medical professional. Um, I one of the questions um, that I also wanted to ask is, you know, what are you some of the lessons you think um, the um, Hong Kong it seems to me it was uh, I think we look at our dates. January 30th, around, around end of January after Chinese New Year is when uh, this part of the world, we knew there was a, a public health crisis. And it seems like it's hitting the, the rest of the world, other parts of the world right now. What do you think are some of the lessons uh, that, that uh, maybe Korea or, or uh, Italy or other can learn from what has happened to us here in Hong Kong in almost this last month? Mm. Um, so. So what do you think are some of the professionals? Yeah, I think, I think people um, should pay attention to super spreading events. Super spreading events. I, I would like to stress it is event, not the person. So people have to understand in their culture, in their population, what are the super spreading events? So do they have situation where a large number of people stay together closely for a certain long period of time? And, um, and these are super spreading, spreading events. So, so as you said, uh, we work from home, we stop school, but have we think about to encourage people to stop super spreading events? I think Korea, Italy, on actually every country should think about what is the possible super spreading event in their country. I, I, it's, it's some of the things that we've been hearing about, you know, maybe in Japan, they are talking about the Olympics. Uh, as a super spreading event. Do you think uh, by, I mean, the Olympic is this summer, do you think it's something that we may need to worry about still in, in the summer about? Well, well, it's still early, but one has to be prepared. I think, I think the um, Japanese government should have a, um, a strategy to monitor the situation and then plan well ahead. So what kind of community spread can they afford? What level can they afford to allow Olympic to go on? Or to what level they will stop? And they should inform the public, the organizers well in advance. So everyone get prepared. I see. Um, so one of the questions I want to ask you, um, and I've asked um, the other two previous speakers as well, um, what are you personally um, worrying about now? Uh, in terms of uh, the, the virus? Um, is it the spread? Is it, uh, is it complacency? Is it, uh, you know, you personally at this moment, because as we mentioned, things change daily 
um, uh, and but at this moment, what are some of your personal um, uh, what you're worried about? Well, well, as I can see, for pretty healthy person, this is going to be um, like a, a bad influencer for he or she. Uh, he, or, he or she will suffer and then fall ill for a short period of time and then recover. But for people who have uh, pre-existing disease like diabetes, those kind of things, this is going to be very severe. It's going to be life-threatening disease. So that's what I, I'm mo most worried about. Yeah. Well, so I'm actually personally learning from this is stay healthy and, and, and work out and, and eat and sleep well. And I have to say one of the side effects has been that because we are working from home or <laughs> there's less social outings, yeah, I find myself yeah. um, uh, getting plenty of sleep and plenty of exercise. And it seems to me that's one lesson uh, that we can all take away. It is really staying healthy. And uh, I, I would like to say stress both mentally and physically. So do you think mentally, I think, um, is there been an overblown? I mean, I think a couple of weeks ago we were worried about, you know, running out of toilet papers, running out of masks and all that. There's mm. been a lot of, um, you know, I, I find that uh, people putting it on themselves were, and uh, the false, the fake news, some of the, the uh, contribute to that. Mm. So the both physically and mentally staying healthy um, is that advice that you would give um, certainly, to people? Certainly, because now we are, we are relying on ourselves, our immune system to fight the virus. So if you are, uh, for, for whatever reason, if you are not in a good state, then your fighting soldiers will not be as good. I see. Good advice. And there's one question coming from uh, online, uh, which uh, I want to share. Uh, one of our um, uh, audience members asked, uh, I'm concerned about using the 1.99 uh, bleach solution in my home uh, mm. for environmental effect. Are regularly, regular environmental friendly, plant-based cleanser sufficient, or does it have to be bleach? Well, um, I don't have the full knowledge to say whether the plant-based disinfectant is good or not. Well, if I'm not sure, I personally will still use bleach at a percentage that is correct. Uh, but I'm not saying that the plant-based disinfectant is not good because this is a virus, it's not too difficult to kill, yeah? You do not need extremely hard things to kill it. it it's just usual soap detergent will be. So the plant-based, maybe take a look at the detailed information, maybe it's okay. Okay. Um, so I think we have most of the questions that we've already asked. So can you also talk about um, children in this case. I know uh, when we first, episode one, uh, Professor Cowling from Hong Kong U was looking at one of his study is really the, the role of children in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the way uh, their defense, their immune, um, the study. And also we know from uh, the flu and influenza, um, I often hear stories of uh, kids uh, getting sick uh, from, from their classmates bringing home and mom and dad, parents or grandparents getting sick. The, the role of children in this COVID-19, some of the cases we've heard, uh, the children has been not, uh, you know, it, it, the, the fatality has been very much the elderly. So, mm -hmm. but I think the role of children and their immune in this COVID-19, as a virologist, I wonder if you can also kind of touch upon that. Well, our experience from SARS-2003, which is the closest uh, human virus to this uh, novel coronavirus, was that um, in SARS, Children are infected, but they are mild, so much, much milder. And we really hope this feature retain the same. And so far, we do not see severe case of lawful coronavirus in children, I mean, even in elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But we, of course, we want to um, um, be careful about this situation. So, so far, there's no um, alarming news about the children. But I guess because, um I guess, you know, now that we know the children, um, because of school uh, closure uh, and, and, you know, they are not playing. I, in fact, I think that's been one of the uh, um, interesting um, development here because during SARS, schools did not close, correct? Initially, yeah. Initially did not. Yeah. So right now, I think maybe we've learned our lesson uh, from that, uh, from SARS. Uh, th this question also come from the audience. Um, there are around 30,000 recovered cases out of about, is it 80,000 cases now? Uh, what is defined as recovered? Um, and any chance that they might get infected again after they recovered? 
Mm. So I think I can only answer from a very general perspective. When a medical profession regards certain patient recover, uh, usually they mean the symptoms resolve, right? They cough, they stop the cough, or much improve. So that's called recovered. And I think in this situation, they will be discharged from the hospital. I think the key question people want to know whether they will be infected again. Now, um, although we still have to wait for a, a, a very confident answer, but usually this kind of acute viral infection, they will give you immunity. That means protect you from further infection, at least for a certain period. We are talking about years, if not 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, another question from the audience, how and why do people die from this coronavirus? Well, this virus typically, they infect deep into the lung, and with such infection, uh, they will damage the lung capacity to breathe. And furthermore, this virus um, like to attract a very robust, but sometimes uh, not so, um, sometimes harmful immune response from the person. So it's like uh, triggering a too much response. In that way, uh, the person are being damaged to do to, due to this overwhelming immune response. And one of my understanding, some of the, the death, who, uh, those who have not, uh, who are not elderly, maybe in their 50s and 60s, um, because they were, they had pre existing physicians, so mm, whether they're diabetes mm, or mm, other, uh, and that kind of contribute mm. to their early, you know, mortality. Yes, if, if you look at influenza, uh, they also try to uh, kill more those people who have uh, underlying problem. So this is the same, and the uh, same phenomenon. Uh, another question here is, why is the origin uh, still not, uh, still uncertain? Uh, uh, is it bats? Uh, I think last time, I think it's it civet cats, bats, and this time we've been talking about uh, pangolin. So why is it the, it's still not uncertain? Do you think um, that will, we will find that answer soon? Well, um, from the gene sequence of the virus, we suspect um, like Bat or the penguin will be some closely related, but I think either of them are still not the most immediate host, immediate animal bringing the virus to human. Maybe they are involved in certain pathway of the changes that the virus has to acquire before coming to human. So I think we still don't know the immediate source of this virus yet. Uh, uh, but I hopefully we'll get to it. Do you think uh, the, the, the possibility of getting to that answer, even if it's uh, after this is over, it's always nice to know the source so that we can learn from it. Do you think? Yeah, I think, I think if we it? have a chance to search for more possible uh, kinds of animals, especially those uh, human people in China like to consume, then if we test more, then we know more about this uh, source of this virus. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this question is that with s many people suffering from COVID-19 only have mild symptoms. Uh, why do we still need such high level of quarantine measures than the most deadly flu? Uh, is it because it's new uh, and that we have no, uh, no, no um, uh, cure for it? Is that why justifying the high, qu high level quarantine measures or self? Well, well, Roughly, we know that around 80% of the infected person are actually not that ill, so they are mild infection. Um, but there is uh, quite a proportion, like more than 10% people are really critical. So in that case, we cannot say this is a very mild disease. And it's different from influenza. For influenza, we have drugs to treat. At least some people will benefit from the treatment, and we have vaccine to prevent. But for this one, we don't. So that's why we want to do whatever we can to slow down the spread, hopefully to buy time, and then one day we have a drug, we have a vaccine, then we, uh, we know how to deal with it. Well, one of the questions here has been talking about the different uh, ways, proven therapy, um, anti-HIV -HIV drugs, and I think plasma was another thing that I heard about. So what do you think personally, how long do you, uh, do you think we will, it'll take us to come up with a vaccine or um, I, not, I, I know it's not a cure, but how long do you think? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of international collaboration. I think mean, the, the pharma companies are doing it. Do you, uh, from a personal, professional ex uh, experience, how long do you think? Well, as for the antiviral treatment, uh, I know there are already a few clinical trials going on with good number of patients enrolled. 
So I think it won't be long to see the result, at least to select the most, the best available treatment option. Then for the vaccine, I'm, I'm very pessimistic. And uh, sorry, I'm optimistic. You're optimistic. Um, optimistic, okay. yeah. Because now with the technology, I already come across a few institutes that have vaccine moving very fast. And there's good hope that one of them will be successful or more than a few of them could be successful. Well, it's also, it seems to me right now with China being the major, uh, the, the one that has the most case and also uh, compared to SARS, 17 years ago, there was a lot of uh, uh, industry and also seems to me China will also play a role in trying to find a, either a, a, some sort of vaccine or something. Um, do you think that's a possibility? With yeah, I think, so. I think so because um, the technology in China has been uh, advancing very quickly and they certainly, they have, I think they have a vaccine uh, going on, developing mm -hmm. and they, they have drugs coming out and um, I think we don't have to wait too long. Um, this question, um, I'm not, okay, this question uh, asks, in Singapore, 62 out of 93 have recovered from uh, COVID-19. Uh, in Hong Kong, it's been 24 out of 91 recovered. Uh, what makes Hong Kong so ineff inefficient in treat the patients? Do you think that's the case or do you think... Uh, they have uh, I, I, I think figure something out? Uh, these numbers are perhaps may not be able to reflect the, the really successful way in treating them. Yeah. Okay. Um, did a WHO provide any guidance uh, on what who needs to get the uh, COVID-19 test? And if the criteria is different among countries, um, uh, is there underreporting countries uh, with less tests? Well, um, Actually, WHO give a lot of guidance on like how to perform the test and what is the best use and technical as well as applicable uh, advices. But of course, WHO cannot dictate in each city how you use the test because uh, in each city, the situation is different, especially the availability of the test reagent will be different in each city. So, um, and uh, we should not assume the kind of reporting will be the same throughout the world. There are certain places maybe just relying on symptoms, mm -hmm. maybe certain places relying on tests, and also like in Hong Kong, we just we test once and then we test again before we say it is positive. So different levels of uh, reporting system there. Um, how do you think, in your um, opinion, um, let's go back to a week ago with the, the Diamond Princess. I feel like there are a lot of lessons uh, to learn from that in terms of the testing. Um, it seems to me initially the Japanese uh, official, maybe they themselves have, has also contracted uh, uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So do you see some lessons from that isolated incident mm. because so many spread uh, in, 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 uh, so quickly, and, but professionally it seems like uh, maybe they're not fast enough mm. in in terms of uh, action taken, or maybe not cautious enough. What, what do you do? You do you see a, a lessons there? Well, uh, I must confess, I I know those from TV, from news, so uh, I may not be able to make a fair comment. But just a few suspicions that I think we want to know more about is that the way they use the tests, um, they test people. If I'm, I'm correct, they test people. If they're negative, then they allow them to uh, go away back home or something. Now, in fact, we should not use a negative test result to discharge people because they may still incubating the virus. Maybe a few days later, they have uh, uh, enough virus for you to test, but not I today. See. I see. So this kind of discharge people based on a negative test while they are incubating the virus is, to me, is absolutely a, a unacceptable concept. But I may be wrong. I may not know everything, uh, what happening in the, in the cruise ship. Mm -hmm. um, I think right now, um, 2003, uh, going back to the question of 2003, what were you doing in doing SARS? What, kind of, what lessons have you yourself as a professional learned from uh, SARS in 2003? I think in 2003, we learned that um, there are things called super spreading events. 
that we left so it's imagine. not a super spreader because yeah. in the beginning we were event. thinking it was people. It's, it's not people, it's the event. We actually, at least myself, have not come across such kind of event. It's the first thing uh, uh, we learned from uh, such a new virus, mm -hmm. they can behave in this way. And now, in this low for coronavirus, they are repeating. They are giving you super spreading event again. And so what do you, would you, pr um, so right now, um, I guess we already talked about the Olympic question and, and people are, you know, canceling concerts and in Hong Kong we certainly learned the case, but I think in terms of the, the technology, um, we certainly are using technologies to still do our program and so on. Um, compare, I guess the flip side of the, the fake news that technology spread, but it's also right now information sharing is also a lot quicker. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, almost instantaneously, uh, this, this broadcast will go throughout our, our, our whole entire network. So I guess the, the flip side of technology is also information, good information can also be spread mm. quite quickly mm. as well as the bad. So we hope to see more of the, I understand uh, CUHK is working on uh, a platform uh, as well to share uh, information. Can you talk about some of the stuff that you're doing at uh, the university um, in, 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 in your department, sharing that information with the public? Because I find that this is the questions, to be able to ask questions directly of an expert, and you know, uh, that is really is something people are all really looking, for, looking to. So can you talk about so, more about so CUHK's effort? Basically, we are, we are trying to see um, uh, how to make the good use of news media, because on one hand, they are very fast, they search information, they have, um, you know, their professions to search for information. So we, we try to understand how we can make the best use of uh, media information is such kind of outbreak. And of course, try to find out um, what are the in inadequacies so that uh, maybe in the future, uh, we can really um, take them into part of the ball game to help the uh, public health people to fight against if there's any further outbreak again. Um, I guess here it's another question. I think this was also asked previously, but I think you might have already answered it about the, uh, the, the, the droplets. Uh, many people are flocking to buy air purifiers that claim to be antivirus. Uh, is it effective? Well, first, um, air purifier, they purify air, right? So if the virus is not spread by air broom, so you would not expect the room will have um, air containing the virus. So, so what you are purifying is the air, but not the virus. I see. So I think it would be more effective if you, you clean with alcohol or, or Clorox over the surfaces, the ha door handle, that would be more effective then. Um, and that seems to be a nest lesson that w Hong Kong has learned really well mm. from uh, uh, 2003 because um, right now every um, uh, button, uh, the, yes. the elevator button, everybody sanitize it. Um, mm. I know here in Hong Kong we've been doing this for, you know, since yes. 2003. Yes. That's not happening rest of the world that mm -hmm. much, I, having lived in New York for nine years. So is this, uh, and, and this, this hygiene, this aware of hygiene is certainly part of Hong Kong's DNA these days. Yes. Uh, and and yes. also another thing, the mask wear, you know, it used to be you only see people wearing masks in Japan uh, or people who are sick, but now this mask wearing is very much part of, uh, of this uh, COVID-19 um, yes. culture. So sounds like we have learned uh, from uh, uh, our experiences and I hope we can share this with um, the rest of the world, even though it may not look as, um, we, we may not see each other as, you know, but we are still able to socialize with each other. We are still able to do things together. Um, maybe now may more use of the technology and so on. But in terms of um, right now, what are some of the things that you would advise? Uh, another worry has been that with China, uh, you know, people going back to work, uh, the factory reopening, and do you see a kind of a, 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 the numbers, right now numbers in China have dropped in terms of day-to-day -day numbers, but as slowly factories um, coming back online and, and also many of the factories now we know are in southern China in, the, um, uh, in, in, in Shenzhen and all that, do you, would, do you yourself foresee a, like a, a number coming back up in China uh, with, with people returning to their work units? I think 
I think probably yes, when we try to, you know, resume to a normal life a little bit, I think the virus may, the infection may bounce back, hopefully a little bit, at a certain uh, affordable degree. And if it bounces back to an uncontrolled manner, then we have to institute back all the measures to uh, social distancing and so on. Um, I think to be re realistic, the public health policy will aim at containing the infection. So there will be some level of infection, but to a level that the system can afford, that is more realistic uh, goal of these uh, policies. Um, I think we're kind of running out of questions. It's good. People, if you have questions, please share with us. And uh, But right now, before a uh, new question come in, it's, uh, just kind of, uh, Professor Chen, your just general advice right now, um, are you in this month, since uh, end of January and now, um, in terms of Hong Kong's development, um, would you, are you happy with, you know, kind of the numbers? I mean, so far, the numbers seem to be very steady. And I was talking to friends um, yesterday and today. Um, you know, I know we've been through a lot this last couple of months with the social unrest, but, and people have been criticizing um, the government, but, and I don't want to make this a political question, but that's just looking from a public health uh, official, uh, you know, in a uh, perspective. Do you think we've done an okay job here in Hong Kong? Well, well to be fair, I think we, um the Hong Kong government is implementing um, the measures in in a quite effective way. If we look at the situation from the more scientific point of view, we try to understand, uh, say, if one person infected, how many person the spread the infection goes to. If it is above one, then a lot very good because you are seeing accumulating number of patient, uh, patients. If it is below one then you have a chance to control and maybe even eliminate the infection. So what we are seeing is below one in Hong Kong. So in that aspect, I think we are doing reasonably good or, or an okay job at least for this outbreak. Yeah. And um, also, let's talk about China a little bit. Again, don't want to make it political, but I think... Um, in some ways, if we look at uh, what the government has done in Wuhan, I mean, whether it's uh, draconian or what, but it has been effective. In fact, I remember reading, um, I think it was at CMP, uh, right around Chinese New Year, they said millions of people are leaving Wuhan and, and there's gonna be uh, a lot more problems because of the, the, the origin being coming from Wuhan. Considering that, I remember that was really kind of scary and comparing it to now, I'm still surprised. Uh, are you surprised at the low numbers? I mean, or is it how, why, you know, Singapore, I'm, I'm surprised at the high number. And maybe part of it is traveling. I think right now, mm. whether it's, um, uh, um, uh, you know, people travel all over, tourism, all that. So I guess I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised at the numbers from, uh, with all the people leaving Wuhan for the holiday, and then it's still... And the government def definitely has kept uh, an eye on, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of lockdown of that. Um, so I guess that policy worked? Yeah, I think in, in China, um, you have to accept that they really, um, now they control to a certain extent. And the kind of policy they implement is very strict. I think not every country will step into that kind of uh, strict policy. But obviously they have, they, they, they have the origin and they have a uh, lot of cases in short period of time. So all these give them support to institute a very strict policy. So it's really freezing all activity in the city. So this kind of policy now achieve an effect and that is expected. But I think to be honest, it will be very difficult to continue this kind of strict policy. That means you ask people just freeze their activity. So we cannot continue for too long. And then we have to accept the fact that this is a very infectious virus. And then we have to move to the next phase, how to face this infection. Yeah. What are some of the numbers that you're gonna be looking for in the coming weeks? 
Um, you know, right now, I know Hong Kong, our numbers seem to be steady, but uh, outside of Hong Kong, the numbers are rising. But what are you um, going to be concerned about, the numbers you're going to look for that will, um, I guess, the pandemic question, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. I think you answered that mm -hmm. already. Uh, and in the States now, they're predicting that it, it could be, it's, it's not uh, if, but when. So, so what are some of the stuff that you're thinking, looking for number-wise? Well, I think um, the numbers of new cases in China overall will keep decreasing. But although it is decreasing, it is still a large number there. Whereas the number in other cities, obviously in Japan, Korea, Italy, and perhaps other European cities as well, will be increasing. Um, I would guess the virus um, in their eyes is, is like um, more hidden because at this stage, it's no longer only uh, the Chinese tourists bringing it in. It is already hidden in their country, in their cities. So when they see the infection, it will be like a cluster coming out, emerge before they, they know. And obviously, in most parts of the world, they are not testing as frequent as Hong Kong. I think even for people with fever and cough, you won't test everyone for this new virus. So you will, you will only know when there's a very obvious cluster and urge you to spend the money to test. What would be your advice now? Right now, it seems to me the closest to us is Korea. You know, right, and the numbers just really skyrocketed, you know, in a couple of days. And mm. if you were advising the president of Korea, you know, what would you tell him? I mean, it seems to me... Um, it, this kind of caught them off guard. I think in the situation is like a um, replica of Wuhan city. So if perhaps not the whole Korea, not the whole South Korea, it is certain cities, they have to institute the hardest measure, freezing people activity. And then they test, and then they map out who is infected, let it die down a little bit, like what is happening in Wuhan and hopefully they can do it within a few weeks, they see the dying down of the infection, then they can, they can move to the next step. Um, I think right now we talked about the states and I think various cities, I, mean, I think people um, are looking at, um, I, I'm also really interested in seeing, you know, having a, f a family and friends and a lot of friends in the, in the US. How do you think, um, do, you, do you see a pattern uh, that is gonna hit the U.S. I know uh, in San Francisco they already um, kind of uh, came up with a, um, uh, some sort of emergency rule. I, I think the city itself is getting ready to prepare for an onslaught of, of COVID. So, what are some of the advice that for these each some of these cities, maybe these clusters? Um, I, I, is it the same as you would for, uh, uh, for Korea? Um, it seems like it is cities like Wuhan, mm, Daegu, mm, and all that. Um, so, how how would you advise a city? mayors? I think in, for example, in United States, they are still at maybe situation like what we are having a month or six weeks ago. So they have, if they have, it will be few cases with more clear contact history, uh, perhaps linked to certain Chinese or now maybe, maybe Korea, maybe Japan, these kind of uh, epicenter regions. So it is still easier for them to catch every case and trace their contact to institute like isolation, this kind of uh, very stringent measure to, to hold it. So they're still at this stage, and they, uh, I believe they are working on this direction to institute the highest possible measure. I remember um, I was in New York around the time at Ebola, and they were very quite effective, the city itself, uh, attracting um, you know, uh, mm. people who came in with possible Ebola, and uh, and so a lot of it was technology, the government um, uh, uh, officials working on that. So I, I think certain cities are more prepared for these kind of things mm. than others, mm. um, and and so some cities may not be as uh, uh, you know savvy about certain things. So so it seems like it's going to be we're, we're going to wait and see, but hopefully everybody. Uh, will have learned from each other in terms of information sharing. Yes. So do you think that is, um, it sounds to me like through the group that you're involved with in WHO or CDC, 
uh, that information sharing, do you think that network has been effective in terms of sharing information um, and, and sharing knowledge? Well, I think um, it's much, much better than the situation in SARS-2003. Um, say for the um, essential information like how to detect the virus. So we got the information almost instant and uh, the mainland people, the, the scientists, they find the virus and they um, allow the sequence to be read by everyone just in the public domain. And then very soon people uh, develop tests based on that and they also share the information in public domain. So, and, and we are very glad that there are a uh, reagent producing company do that and produce to people in a very reasonable price, no mm -hmm. no extra charging and this kind of thing are, are sharing very good. And um, like the academic journals, they publish reports very quickly so that you learn what's happening in uh, China, what's happening in, for example, Canada, if they have a case, and also in in those countries. So I think we do have pretty good information um, and for this outbreak than ever we have before. Great. Um, I think on that note, uh, I want to thank you for your time. And, uh, and really, um, every time I have to say personally, when I have an opportunity to talk to experts like yourself, I feel um, better afterward because uh, there's just so much information out there. But you know, to be able to hear from um, somebody who is in this field and also have um, years of experience, and we continue, we look forward to continue to bring you um, uh, episodes like this. Uh, we have another one planned next week with a panel of uh, three, uh, four experts from uh, uh, both uh, Hong Kong and US. And, and please continue to send us your questions. Um, I think it's times like this, I, I really appreciate uh, knowledge and sharing. Although we can't uh, bring you public programs in, in our, um, in this room or in, in elsewhere, we can still share information with you. And I think this is the beauty of, of Hong Kong um, and Asia Society Hong Kong. We've had had experience, unfortunately, 17 years ago with SARS, but I think we learned from it. And I think as a community, um, we're really, um, uh, we're stronger for this. And, uh, and I'm really thanks, Professor Chen, for your time. And look forward, uh, on our website, we will be putting, um, I think, CUHK and other um, university academic institution, their research. And also, we'll also be sharing you uh, links. Uh, many of you now, we understand, uh, unlike a few weeks ago, we're running out of uh, masks. Uh, some, I just got a delivery, uh, thanks to my family, uh, earlier this week. And I think the community still needs a mask, especially the elderly. I, I think that is something that we learned about COVID-19. Uh, the elderly are affected a lot more. So if there are ways of, for you to donate the mask, uh, please, we will have something on our website uh, that's linked to um, SCN SCMP's uh, website to donate to the community as well as to the uh, elderly uh, because this is affecting all of us. But some of us um, can do something about it and I encourage all of us to really think positive and, and stay healthy and thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Chen. Thank you.